my first text I'm going to talk to you about is a fragment of Sappho. You've, again, you've, gone f you've started thinking about epic, you've started thinking about the, grand s the, the massive scale, the huge kind of scope of narrative across 24 books of epic. Now I'm going to show you how narrative can work and get you to think about storytelling from the perspective of desire through two different texts. The first is a fragment of Sappho, so snapshots of desire. There is the Greek text of Sappho fragment 22. It survives only on a papyrus fragment written down maybe kind of seven, at least 700 years after Sappho was first composed and performed in archaic Lesbos. She's early, early 6th century BC poetry. The immediate thing when we are confronted by this, this fragment, is wanting to know. We want to know more. We desire to fill in those gaps, to find the answers, to find more out about Sappho's story from these fragmentary remains. This is a useful and important starting point for me because when you read Sappho at all, when you read Sappho's poetry in the detail we have it, even when we've got complete poems, what Sappho is doing is getting you to think about fragments of experience, little snapshots of experience, how those can communicate big ideas across not, not just little snapshots of experience, but across time, across the entirety of time from archaic, remote, fragmentary, difficult to assess, difficult to grapple archaic Greece into the contemporary. So this is the fragment of Sappho which Anne Carson's translation of Sappho, if not Winter, gets its title from. Anne Carson is a contemporary poet, a uh, Canadian writer, very well known for writing about antiquity in her poetry. She's translated Sappho in an extremely alluring way. Just by thinking about the phrase, if not winter, if something doesn't happen to me, winter, desolation, we are already in three words in the Greek, in three words in the English, into a story into an account about somebody's personality, somebody's psychology, somebody's anxieties, fears, hopes, feelings about themselves, whoever that person is, whether it's Sappho in reality, whether it's any kind of lover, whether it's any kind of person, however they're articulating their feelings, right? Winter gives you a sense of time. It gives you a sense of the seasonal, gives you a sense of the trans-temporal, across time beyond little moments, little snapshots in time. But there we have a little snapshot of an experience, if not winter. It's this extraordinary, in Carson's translation of the Sappho at least, bringing out the oscillation between that idea of a momentary feeling and its transmission across much bigger cycles of time and feeling and experience. That basic idea is written across the rest of this fragment, which articulates a moment in time, a series of feelings, an encounter with the love goddess herself, Aphrodite, Kiprogenea, in the Greek there, in the English translation. In fact, she herself once blamed me Kiprogenea is the subject here, because I prayed this word, I want. The love goddess herself was blaming the, the speaker because she desired something. There's a story there about feeling and about emotion and experience and psychology connected with love and desire. But that is not being played out in a full way in the ways at which you feel these kinds of things get played out in big stories in big epic narratives, in texts like the Iliad or the Odyssey, feelings about Penelope, feelings you might have about Penelope in the Odyssey or about Helen in, in the Iliad or Thetis in the Iliad or Briseis in the Iliad, but by little snapshots of experience. And what lyric poetry does, 
and Sappho is very frequently thought of as thinking about epic at the same time as thinking about these little snapshots. It's thinking about how lyric can communicate little moments in time that do things again and again and again. So here we have, uh, I bid you sing of Gongola, taking up your lyre as now again longing floats around you. There's a moment in time, a feeling of performance and speaking and desire that is a repetition, a process of repeating that moment of insta instantaneousness. How is that moment of instantaneousness uh, articulated as the, as the poem continues? Through this moment of looking, this moment of looking at a girl's dress, for her dress, when you saw it, stirred you, and I rejoice. The poem celebrates, the poem speaker celebrates that snapshot, that little split second of time when somebody looks at something and likes what they see. This is, again, very different from the way epic works with storytelling. But this is integral to how lyric poetry works, how lyric poetry gets you to think about snapshots of time, moments of experience, but then develops them, sells them, projects them across time into your books when you read them, changing the way you feel, structuring the way you think about the things you look at, the ways you behave, the ways you feel. Obviously, there are going to be lots of differences in the, in the shifts, all kinds of shifts in cultural shifts, social shifts, between the archaic space and time of Sappho in Lesbos in the early 6th century BC and your experiences and feelings now, but what Sappho is so important for is giving structure to and importance for, across the entirety of time, these moments, these, for want of a better word, vulnerable moments, these moments of insecurity, doubt, fear, if not winter, right? And what poetry does, what poetry can do, what lyric poetry can do better than any other kind of poetry, this small scale storytelling can do, is project those moments of experience as really, really important. Really important for everybody to think about who they are in all the ways they live their lives, all of you, how you feel about anything, lyric poetry can help you think about that. So snapshots of desire. That's my first example. So there's one of two. My second example is another piece of lyric poetry, but a very different kind of lyric poetry from Sappho. A fragment of a poet roughly contemporary with Sappho called Stesichorus. He wrote a huge, probably at least, at least 1,400 lines long, several books of the Iliad long, narrative poem about Heracles and his journey into the West to encounter and slay a monster called Geryon, uh, a, a guy who had multiple heads and posed a big challenge to Heracles in the killing, overcoming of this monster. And this is obviously, in many ways, an epic kind of story. It's big. It's got really huge characters, really, really well-crafted characters. Lots of storytelling, lots of detail across uh, how the battle unfolded. Again, very familiar kinds of storytelling lots of blood and guts killing that you feel if you read lots of Homer, when you read the Iliad. You can't get away from certain aspects of this text. The detail about the characterization of death, the agony, the pain, the blood, all the, all the grim, close detail about bones shattering, right? Um, all that detail about all the ways in which Geryon feels this pain, right? That's all very epic, all very Iliadic, right? all very Homeric. So I've highlighted some of those words there. But some of those words there 
do things that Epic doesn't do. Their inventions by Stesichorus, Homer invents loads of words himself, but Stesichorus invents words of his own that really get you thinking about the words, really get you thinking about the sounds and shapes of individual words. So in the case of the, the uh, lines 35 to 6, in the Greek, Olesanoros aeolodeiru odunaisin hudras. With the agonies of the man-slaying, writhing-necked hydra, we really feel the descriptive detail. Homer does descriptive detail, but he doesn't do descriptive detail to that extent. This, is, this point is made even clearer by how this poem, uh, how this section of the poem finishes. So one of, one of Geryon's heads droops to one side, one of his heads, because he's a multi-headed monster. Right? One of Geryon's heads, he drooped his neck to one side, like a poppy spoiling its delicate body suddenly sheds its petals. This is epic. This is an epic simile that, that Stesichorus has borrowed from a famous simile in Iliad Book 8, describing the death of one of um, the Trojan princes. But Stesichorus has, has extended it. He's done something with it. He's transformed it by adding more detail. He's adding more detail about the beauty of the poppy and the body that kind of merges into one, the beauty of Geryon's body, the beauty of the poppy that merges together in our moment of recognition of Geryon's demise. What Stesichorus is doing here in this simile is a bit like what Sappho is doing in that first example, right? Getting you to think about snapshots in time. That moment when a poppy falls, its petals fall off. The moments when drops of rain fall and the petals fall off a poppy. Right? The moment of Gorgithian's ultimate pain. But that moment becomes even more kind of emphasized and emphatic because of the way that Stesichorus' ability as a lyric poet enables him to focus on language and in detail. So not just like a poppy, but like a poppy spoiling its delicate body. The vulnerability, the beauty of the body, its delicacy shedding its petals, makes you think about vulnerability in those snapshots in time. But you also therefore get to think about how that rubs off on what you feel should, should be your response to Geryon. He's supposed to be a monster, right? He's supposed to be this bloodthirsty monster, the massive match for Heracles. Heracles has to, has to crouch and shoots him with an arrow at this point because he's such a, a, a hugely kind of threatening monster. Stesichorus comes along and says, right, okay, that's how we can, we can do big heroes like that. We can do a massive, a massive epic scale storytelling like we have with battle scenes in Homer, but what I'm going to do is throw lyric poetry into the mix. I'm going to throw everything I know about lyric poetry into the mix in order to get you to think about detail, get you to think about moments in time, get you to think about how to think about epic as a thing, about the storytelling of epic. What Stesichorus essentially does is pull epic apart from within. He's making epic even more kind of extended and hyperbolic, grand, massive, huge in scope with all these over-elaborate characters. And at the same time, he's pulling you in the other direction. He's pulling you away from that sense of the massive, the huge, the um, expansive in scope by going to the other extreme by zooming in, in, in ways that even Homer doesn't do, which are more like what Sappho does, by zooming in on details, by zooming in on the effective quality of a body or a little flower, in ways that make you linger and think about those moments of detail 
in an otherwise fast-paced kind of multi-dimensional hugely energetic diverse huge poem a bit like some of the storytelling in Homer's Iliad so I'm going to finish there but give you an idea that some of the kinds of poems you can think about in classical literature can really get you from the inside from within thinking about how they're written to consider afresh in new ways how classical literature works kind of gets you to challenge your assumptions about what classical literature is or what classical storytelling is you think storytelling is all about big scale plots massive multi-dimensional scenes you know the return of Odysseus Achilles' slaughter of Hector it is about that but there are also ways in which classical literature from from really early on in classical literature can show you other things too and use those resources to point your attention in other directions okay so that's enough for me plenty of time for <laughs> plenty of time for questions at the end let me hand over to uh, victoria Hi, how are you all doing? I, I'm aware that you've been sitting on these seats for quite a while now, and I'm going to try and sustain your attention for just 15 to 20 minutes longer with some more flesh, blood and gore, but not in a, not in a horrible histories way, in a different way that's similar to what uh, David's done. And I want to talk to you about a different kind of short, uh, small-scale poem from the ancient world, not lyric this time, but epigram. Now, epigram, I don't know if you know what an epigram is, but it's not a poem written in a particular rhythm or, or uh, meter, but it's generally a very short, light poem. It's sometimes written for an occasion. It's quite often funny or witty with a characteristic punchline. Um, and it might tell a story, but the story it tells, a little bit like what David was saying about lyric, is a quick one. So quick it's almost a snapshot. So you go kind of wow, and then... You see it, and it's gone. So insofar as we know, or we think we know what an epigram is, we have some idea of, of what it is uh, in the modern world, uh, that idea basically comes from the poet I want to talk to you about, and that's Marshall. I don't know whether you've... <laughs> some of these heard of Marshall. Uh, Marshall was a Roman poet, but he originally came from Spain. And he was active uh, right at the end of the first century AD. Um, and... This may not seem that odd to us today because people, you know, you might get singers who just write pop music or rappers who just do rap. But it was very weird in the ancient world to just write in one kind of song. And that's what's weird about Marshall. He built an entire career, an entire universe out of the epigram. It's this tiny, small scale poem, sometimes just poems two lines long. Um, and I want to talk to you about two poems. So I'll move the... Yeah, this is me. Um, I want to talk to you about two poems that come from this book, his debut little book, Libellus, uh, that we call On Spectacles, or the Liber de Spectaculis. And believe it or not, this little book was uh, written or possibly even commissioned to celebrate the big opening of the Colosseum. Now, you know, all know what the Colosseum is, right? The big big old building in the center of Rome. Okay. Um, now, the, 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 as I say, the crazy thing about Marshall is that he only wrote about epigram. He wrote, he wrote in epigram, rather, and he wrote about epigram, too, in epigrams. It's a very self-conscious genre. Um, what he did is basically reinvent the epigram. It wasn't new in Marshall. You know, we have epigrams going back to archaic Greece. But what he did is to reinvent it. And he reinvented it in a way that makes it the closest thing we have from the ancient world to tweeting, Instagram posts, blogging, texting even, right? And you'll notice, if I go back, slide, right? Um, no, I haven't got the word epigram on there. Um, this is epigram, right? And it's rather close to the word Instagram. I wonder who knows why, what, what is the, 
What is the ending gram? What does that mean that Marshall is drawing on? Well, there's the Greek word gramma, G-R-A-M-M-A, -A, right? And what that means is a letter, a mark, uh, a thing written, or even a picture, okay? Um, and yeah, basically Marshall creates this entire universe from these little poems. Um, 15 books in all, beginning with this one. Um, and they're on every subject you can imagine, right? Dinner parties to eunuchs, right? Even in this book, which is all in the spectacles, there are various um, uh, different themes. And I think what, what's interesting about this kind of comparison that we might be thinking about between epigram and Instagram or epigram and tweeting is that Marshall isn't just interested in this new poetic form, he's interested in the world of its consumption, right? Um, just as we are when we engage with the internet and these various forms of social media. We're interested in the kind of communities it creates, how it makes us experience the world in a different way, what it permits, what, what it allows us to experience in the world. So Marshall's really interested in his audiences and the new ways of consuming poetry in the, the end of the first century AD. So um, he often refers to his poems as kind of fast food, you know, ephemeral little snippets that you can fit into your day, right? So you don't need to be a, a cultured literary person to enjoy epigram. You can fit it into your dinner party. You can uh, read it while you're walking. Um, you can just fit it in between appointments. And he talks about this, and he says, well, you know, I don't mind if you, you know, readers, you can just skip the poems you don't like, and uh, they're probably not much good anyway, and just get to the ones you like. You can rearrange my little books in any way that you desire to fit it into your particular uh, timetable. Okay. Um, and he also talks about actually handling his epigrams in a new form because around this time uh, books were being produced in what we would call a book form, a codex form, as opposed to a papyrus roll. So these are little things that you can hold in your hand, right? But at the same time, so these, these are sort of throwaway fast food poems. But at the same time, because they are things that are material, that they are written down, and epigrams are written down on monuments, right, there's also the sense that these can be long-lasting, right? that they can become, in a perverse way, kind of classics. Or at least, you know, in our terms, they, can, they have the capacity to kind of go viral in the present, so have this kind of longevity. And I think that's interesting to think about in, in terms of the relationship between you know, the, the snippets, the, 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 the short-lasting flashes of, say, Instagram posts and our general experience of the internet, right? There's a paradox there that we're all very aware of and you're being taught at school, right? Don't, don't put anything on the internet because it's not actually as ephemeral as it looks. It's really long-lasting and some, you know, future employer, you know, 30 years from now is going to be Googling you and finding out what you posted in 2019. Right. Now, I'm mentioning all this as a prelude because that kind of paradox, kind of contradiction, is absolutely key to understanding this little book. Okay. Um, now, you all know the Colosseum. Now, even in, it, in its ruined state, this is it, right? It is massive. Who's been to the Colosseum? Right? It, there is something really awe-inspiring about it, even in a modern context, even when you compare it to big football stadiums or massive concert venues. Right? So this is, right, what I'm getting at, this is a huge, epic space. So why on earth is a writer of little, tiny, throwaway poems being asked to write the celebratory book for this inauguration? Now, that is a paradox, but what I want to suggest to you is that it's slightly less weird for us today, isn't it? Because it might be the equivalent of uh, some influencer being asked to kind of live tweet uh, the opening of a new venue, right? Or the opening of a new exhibition or whatever, 
okay? But it's something that Marshall very much plays on, this paradox between the small scale and the epic scale of this building and this event. Now, what he says is that, you know, there were all kinds of spectacles to celebrate this, this opening afternoon or opening night. There were gladiatorial displays. There were fake naval battles. There were executions of all kinds, and that's going to be what I want to talk about um, in just a second. Um, and he also talks about the audience itself as a spectacle, right? Now, true to form, what he gives us in this little book is not a narrative account of the whole thing, right? It's not hyped up as this sort of fluid, um, sort of coherent drama. What he gives us instead are a series of snapshots, little cameos, little sort of photographic um, sort of pictures uh, of what goes on. Often what he's stressing, what he's drawing our attention to, are those weird little moments, those um, things that go wrong, perhaps. Or, you know, he also turns the spotlight onto the crowd and talks about how, you know, you've got people here coming from all over the empire and it's a kind of place to not just watch, but, uh, you know, watch the games, but also watch the, the crowd. Um, so this is the concept that I want to explore with you in, um, in the next 10 minutes. What that approach to narrative, what that sort of distillation of the huge epic drama of this event into a series of snapshots, what kind of experience of the Colosseum, what kind of experience of the spectacles does that give us that we actually can't get in any other way or is distinctive, okay? So, two poems. Um, yeah, just I've got this slide first of all with the, uh, do you remember Gla Gladiators, that show? This is actually live tweeting of gladiators um, on the right. Um, but this is the sort of leitmotif. This is the sort of key line in uh, the second of these poems that I want to talk about that I want to bring to your attention first of all. Marshall says, what became a story, what was once a story, became a punishment. So he gets us thinking about you know, what it is to sort of concentrate a story with a structure and a plot into not just an instant, not just a moment, but a particular vision or even experience of pain. All right, so little links here with what David was saying about the Stadikarov poem. Right, this is the first one. It's just four lines long, and you've got the Latin at the top and then a translation. Now, um, the funny thing about this is uh, that, it, the, well, part, part of the wow of it is that it's one of the few places in uh, Roman literature where we get reference to women gladiators. And it's really exploiting that. It's kind of, you know, wow, this is new, this is novel for the first time, here only, headline, you know, tabloid, uh, intensive headline, there are women gladiators. And what are they doing? They're reenacting a myth. Right? And they're reenacting uh, one of Hercules' labors, which is to slaughter the Nemean lion. Okay. Um, and what Marshall is saying, we can read it out in a second, is that this amazing modern re real life enactment is usurping, it's taking the place of the ancient narrative. Okay. It's, and that's a kind of violence in itself. So he says, let ancient testimony be silent. For after your shows, Caesar, we have now seen such a thing, such things done by a female hand. And what he's partly playing on, is anyone doing Latin at school here? Yeah, some of you, right? So in the end of the second line in the Latin, the, the, the Latin for the work of Hercules is that word opus. Now, what Marshall is doing is playing on the double meaning of that word. It's both the labor of Hercules, the, the achievement of Hercules, but opus also means literary work. It can even mean poem, right? So in a sense, what is happening is that this literary work 
is performing the work of Hercules, the spectacle of Hercules' labor in a new way. Okay, and it's more immediate, it's more impressive, it's more wow, and this is also serving to, to sort of put on display the emperor's power, right, as mentioned of Caesar there in the penultimate line. Okay, so just before I move on to the next poem, just, just, just look for, for a brief moment, um, this is, is catering to short attention spans, Marshall, um, just look for a brief moment, especially you studying Latin, just how drawn out that uh, laying low of the lion is in the first line, with those long syllables, prostratum, okay? Um, it's, it's really expansive, it's stretched out, it's epic, but at the same time, you know, this is an incredibly short poem. We only get to dwell on that drawn outness for one word, two words, at the most one line, okay? It's up to us to fill out and imagine the wider story, right? And it's that that makes this tiny narrative or sort of broken down narrative all the more impactful. Or does it? I mean, that's the question, right? Um, is this even a good poem, right? Is it disappointing? What do we lose in replacing old with new? narrative with snapshot what gets silenced what is in the silence and i think this is a very interesting question for us now as we experience the world you know that i know people who literally live on twitter right so effectively their, their experience of the world is twitter you know what does that do what does that do to the world what kind of experience it, it, is it and what does it do to us right this is the kind of question that marshall's getting at right on to um, the next poem. Sorry about the slightly small script. I'm going to read it out to you. It's slightly longer and it's much more gory. It's about the crucifixion of a criminal, a man called Laureolus, who is, Marshall thinks, um, suspected of some terrible crime, but it's not really important what the crime is. It could be arson, it could be killing um, a father, um, it could be something else, it's murder of some kind, probably. And uh, Laurelis is, is, we think, not his real name because we know that Laurelis was a character in a mime that uh, Suetonius tells us was put on during the reign of Caligula and was renowned for its gory special effects. So we immediately join the dots, right? Um, so in other words, this poor prisoner is already playing a kind of jokey theatrical role. He's already kind of you know, being an actor in the arena for our entertainment. But he's also, and you'll see now when I read it out, perhaps paradoxically, being identified with a mythic figure, Prometheus. Now, Prometheus is perhaps a figure you will have encountered from epic or tragedy, but he's also in these small-scale, light little poems. Um, Prometheus, I don't know whether it, uh, any of you know, very important mythic, uh, a mortal mythic character, the son, well, kind of mortal, uh, he's the son of a titan, and his crime was deceiving Zeus into letting him steal fire from the gods to give to man. So he was a trickster and a rebel, and he was punished terribly by being sent to the underworld, and he was sort of drawn out on a rock, and he had a vulture peck away his liver during the day and then it regenerated itself and he'd be uh, eaten alive uh, once more. Okay, so the poem says, as Prometheus bound on the Scythian rock fed the tireless bird with his too abundant chest, so did Laurelus, hanging on to no fake cross, offer up his guts to a Caledonian bear. His torn limbs lived on, dripping gore, and in all his body, body there was none in the end he got the punishment he deserved he'd stuck a sword into the neck of his father or master or he'd robbed a temple of, eight of secret gold or laid a cruel torch to you Rome the villain had outdone the crimes of ancient tales and what was once a story became a punishment now um, if you know anything about crucifixion if crucifixion is your special topic you will know that it is a long drawn out process Okay, 
it's not very good for you know the flashy spectacle, right? So um, epigram is the perfect response to what the arena offers as a solution to this, which is to get a great big bear to come out of the the underworld under the arena and maul him to death, right? So perfectly catering to spectators of these games who are presented as bloodthirsty, you know, impatient customers, you know, uh, a bit like the, 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 the modern or, or, or neoliberal consumer who is very easily bored, okay? Um, and that's what they get, right? But the poem plays, I just want to spend five minutes looking at the poem itself, okay? The poem plays with breaking down the distinction between the fictional and the real, or between this poetic experience of the spectacles and watching them live, right? And it tells us that the spectacles were themselves about creating fictional experience that contains the thrill of the real, okay? Um, so Laurelis looks like he's acting in a mime, but he's also a real body who's actually suffering and being torn apart. Now, likewise, you'd think the poem might give us a, just a kind of witty, artificial take on this execution. But when we actually read it, we see that it also brings the indescribable, incommunicable violence of the torture home to us. It sort of thrusts that in our face. Okay, so the question is, so how far are we going to let ourselves through this poem experience the actual torture of Romans in the arena? I and mean, this is the, what the kind of, you know, uh, things like horrible histories skirt around. You know, it's all very uh, gory, but there's a sense of artifice and theatricality about it. So we can't access the real thing. And that's why children can be exposed to all this gore, um, right? Um, but Marshall asked that as a question. So how far is the spectacles fictionalized? How much can we distance ourselves from these events as modern readers? Can we even enjoy it? Right? This is about reading poetry. Isn't poetry something you enjoy? Right? So Marshall gets us to reflect on this. You know, how far poetry can make things come alive for us? Right? how far it can get us to feel and experience things that are real. Now, we, we think that music can do this, right? But we don't ask the same question of ancient music or song, which was poetry, okay? The ancient word for poetry and for song is the same word. So what do I mean when, it, when I say I c it can make things come alive or ask us to what extent it can make things come alive for us? Well, look at how he offers his body, Laurelis, uh, hanging on to no fake cross, reminding us that this is real. He offers up his guts to this Caledonian boar. Now, what does it mean to he offers up? It almost gives us a sense of his own desperation, right? This is a, this is a guy who is longing to die and longing to die quickly. And that's what that one word offers uh, suggests to us. One more point. In all his body, body, there was none. So if you look at the Latin very briefly, or even if you can't see, you'll see that um, the Latin word for body, corpus, right, is repeated next to each other, right, in two different forms. So you've got corpore corpus, right? And that's indicative, right? Epigram crams everything in. It reduces events, stories, and feelings to flashes. But that does something. What, we, what we're forced to confront here is a body that is no body. It's not a body. A body that in an instant is reduced to something that is unrecognizable as human. Right? It's both too much, as the repetition of that word corpus indicates, um, and paradoxically, not even there at all, okay? So distilled in that snapshot, too, we might say, is both the spectator's impression of a body, this uncanny impression of a body being eaten alive, and at the same time, the victim's experience of the sheer too-muchness of his pain as he perishes, 
right? And mythical torture and real human torture are linked in this poem by precisely that theme of too muchness or excess. So you see the way that Prometheus, his death is described in the first two lines. His chest was too abundant. That means it kept on regenerating itself, but it was also a focus of his agony. And we feel that also. We feel, you know, as his body becomes part of the vulture's body, as the vulture eats him, we feel that in the Latin, right? Um, so Marshall says, pectore pawit awem. We hear the pecking of the vulture there, okay? Um, so at the end of the poem, just to, to wrap up, um, the poet declares that this real-life execution has surpassed myth. Another way of putting it would be to say that in this poem, the experience of physical pain violently replaces narrative, and that's what epigram can do. Right? And this is what Marshall is interested in showing us. It gets us thinking about what quite, can't quite be expressed in narrative, but can be summoned up as a flash, as a feeling, right? Um, or glimpse between the lines. So I hope you'll go away and read the rest of this um, lovely little book. I can assure you that it's very short. And I hope you've given us, uh, I've given you a sense of what's out there, really, in terms of ancient literature. It's not just your, your Homer, your tragedy, your, your love elegy. You know, there is some, some really uh, amazing stuff that we can relate to, especially from our vantage point of today. And that perhaps you, um, talking to the students here, can relate to better than, um, you know, us decrepit people. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much.